Thank you, Miss Chastity. Enjoyed that. Take your Bibles. Turn to two locations if you can. Judges chapter number six and Hebrews chapter number 11. We won't be at Hebrews, but just for a minute. So if you don't have time or aren't comfortable turning to two places, then go to he- excuse me, Judges chapter number six. And you can actually stick a little marker in there for a few moments while I talk from Hebrews chapter number 11. The title of the message this morning is The One God Found. The One God Found. We started talking last week about Gideon. Did not get finished. Won't really finish today. We'll probably just stop after today. Uh, But we read about Gideon last week and I made a reference to these verses out of Hebrews chapter number 11 last week. But I want to read them to you this week. Hebrews chapter number 11 is God's roll call of faith. Some call it God's hall of faith. Uh, The world has a hall of fame that they put their famous people in. God has a hall of faith that He lists those, some of those in, who have done great exploits. And one person whose name there is the man that we're studying about right now. His name is Gideon. Look at Hebrews 11 verse 32. Hebrews 11 32. And what shall I more say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Now we can continue on But I want you to notice these exploits that are being listed here, primarily in these last two verses that I read. I counted nine of them. Nine of them. And I'm sure that these exploits are describing more than just one man. But just looking, I can see where seven of the nine describe the man that we're talking about, the man Gideon. Go back and look in verse number 33. By faith, it was Gideon who subdued kingdoms, who wrought righteousness, who obtained promises. Over in verse number 34, skip the first one, who escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness was made strong, waxed valiant in fight, and turned to flight the armies of the aliens. That's seven out of the nine exploits describe this man Gideon. Let me tell you, this was a man who was a hero of the faith. We're studying about him in the book of Judges, chapter number six. That's where I'll ask you to go back to. Uh, We've already begun to look at this man's life. We're seeing that we don't have enough time to describe everything the Bible tells us about him. Not in one message, not in two. The same reason that I could not finish last week is the reason why I can't begin over again this week. The reason is there's just not enough time. But I will tell you this. Israel during the days of Gideon had gone under. They had so far turned to evil. They had committed so many evils. They had gotten so deep in their evils that God turned them over to the Midianites for judgment. And the Midianites were doing a very thorough job. They had defeated them militarily. They were oppressing them politically and physically. They had caused the Israelites to be fearful, even to flee. The Bible tells us that they were hiding. The Jews were hiding from the Midianites in the caves, in the dens, in the rocks. However, during all of that time of oppression and punishment, judgment from God, something good did happen. The Bible says that the Jews began to call upon the name of the true God. Jehovah God. And as we go back into chapter number six, we see that God was looking for a person. And the person he found was the man, Gideon. We began last week talking about some of the characteristics that Gideon had. When God found him, some of the characteristics that he found in this man, Gideon. Why look at those characteristics? Because if God was looking for a person like that thousands of years ago, perhaps God's looking for a person like that today. Didn't have time to finish the list. I gave you two items on the list last week. I told you, number one, when God found Gideon, he found a common man. Nothing special about Gideon to start with. The Bible tells us that like many of the other Jews, he was threshing wheat and he was hiding it from the Midianites. That simply meant that his belly got hungry like your belly gets hungry. And it means that his knees knock like your knees knock. 
Uh, he was not too proud to go and hide his food. He was a common man, but spent some time looking at perhaps one of the areas that he was typified as being more common is it's highly possible. I would say it's even probable that the man Gideon was actually offering sacrifices to false gods. We know his family was. We know that his father was, and we understand that he was the son of the father and that he was the primary heir. If he was not compla compliant with his father, he was at least aware of what his father was doing. It's very probable that this man, like so many others, wasn't even a God-fearing man when God first called him. Number one, he was a common man. Number two, he talked about the fact that he was a cleansed man. The Bible tells us back in chapter number six that the same night that God called him, God gave to Gideon some commands. The first command that he gave him was that he needed to go destroy his father's altar, the family altar. He needed to take the wood from that altar and make an altar to God. And then he needed to offer a sacrifice on that altar. I hope you understand what that means. That's God telling Gideon that he needs to disassociate himself with his family gods. It's time to publicly stand up and say, you don't worship Baal anymore. Best way to do that is tear down Baal's altar. But you need to also publicly affirm you are worshiping Jehovah, that you're worshiping the true God of Israel. The best way to do that is take the remnants of dad's altar and build an altar to God. And you need to offer a sin sacrifice. You yourself need to be cleansed. You need to offer a sacrifice. And he was told to go get a bullock and offer that on the altar that he had just made. What was taking place? God was allowing Gideon, the common man, to become Gideon, the cleansed man. I hope you understand. There's no going forward with God until first you take care of your past and your present. In the Old Testament, that was done with a sacrifice on an altar. In today's world, that's done on your knees with the blood of Jesus Christ. We need to be a cleansed people. Number one, he was a common man. Number two, he was a cleansed man. Number three, starting new today, he was a courageous man. He was a courageous man. That's the word that I'm using, but that's really not a good word to describe what the Bible says of this man, Gideon. Look at you would, chapter number six, verse number 12. Notice what the Bible says about him. It says, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, unto Gideon, and said unto him, the Lord is with thee. Notice what the angel of God calls him. Thou mighty man of valor. Thou mighty man of valor. That little phrase in the English, works out to be two good words in the Hebrew. The first word in the Hebrew is the word for mighty. It in itself is a pretty powerful word. It means a captain, a champion, a chief, or a giant. It's got something to do with him being more than just the average. There's something special about him. He is a giant, probably not in physical stature, but I suspect he's talking about in character. There's something about him that's special. The second Hebrew word is the word valor. That means a wealth of something. Mighty man of valor. He's got an abundance of something. Often that refers to virtues, or it can refer to wealth or it can refer to strength or power. It can also be he has a wealth of some things, not just some thing, but some things. A man who's got an army with a large group of soldiers, he's described as a man of valor because he's got many soldiers. If he's got some other kind of force behind him, some other kind of power behind him, those forces could be uh, referred to as a mighty man of valor. If he just had a lot of virtues, a lot of virtues about him, he could be referred to as a mighty man of valor. There's something about Gideon, even before he's called, even before the Holy Spirit of God takes him and begins to work in his life, there's something about this man. He has an abundance of courage he has an abundance of character. He stands out as a giant among his people. Why? Something special about this man. I know we talk about this from time to time, but we are in large part what we choose to be. Before Christ gets into our heart, and especially after Christ gets into our heart. 
I think there's a couple of characteristics that you could say about Gideon. Some things that whether his mom and dad intended him to be like this or not, they had an influence and they shaped him that way. Number one, I think he had a lot of character. I think he was a man of character. Now, there's a lot of things in this world that we can't change about ourselves. We've been studying in Sunday school about the man Saul, King Saul, first king of Israel. Bible says of that man, he's head and shoulders above every other Jew in the land. He was a tall man. You know, you can't do much about that. If you're a short person or a shorter person, you might want to be tall, but you can't do much. And if you happen to be head and shoulders above everybody else, you might wish you were shorter, but you can't do much about that. That's just the way you were born. Bible speaks of a man by the name of Absalom in the, New, in the Old Testament. That's one of David's sons. Bible said he had a beautiful head of hair. Of all the characteristics of this man, the Bible talks about his hair. It was such a long crop. It was such a beautiful crop of hair that he would make a ritual out of it. He'd only get it cut once a year. And it was a feast, a festive day. He was the son of the king. He, it was a festive day. The day that he got it cut, they would weigh what was cut off and they would send the news all through Israel. Believe it or not, we can't do much about that. <laughs> There's just some things you can't change very much. But listen to me, you can determine how much character you have. You can determine what kind of character you have. What is character? Character is you putting into your life the attributes of God while taking out of your life the attributes that are ungodly. Character is what you put into your life. Uh, if we see somebody, we say that person's got a lot of character about him. What we mean when we say that is there's attributes, a lot of attributes of Christ in their life. If we see somebody's got bad character or no character, we are speaking to that person. He either doesn't have any of the attributes of God or he doesn't have many of the attributes of God. Now listen, you don't have to be a saved person to have character. Really, really even lost people ought to be raised to know right behavior from wrong behavior. Inside of our church, I would encourage you if, you, if you've got children or if you want to change your life, you want to be a person of character, I would, I would challenge you to read the Bible. Uh, let's face it, every book in the Bible is telling you what God wants in our life, and it's also telling us what God wants removed from our life. If you're looking for something to read to your kids, read the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is probably one of the most underrated books in the entire Bible. It's got 31 chapters. You could read a chapter to your children every single day. It'd take a whole month to get through the entire book. But the amazing thing about every one of those chapters is it's so packed with truth that if you just pick one proverb out and explain it to your child, it would take you three to four years to explain to them every single Bible verse that's in the book of Proverbs. And by the time you were to do that, three or four years, it'd be time to start all over and start back with the first verses and do it all over again. You wouldn't be able to take your child through the book of Proverbs more than about four times before they're grown up. But I'll promise you, you'll raise you a child that's got some character because that's exactly why the book of Proverbs was written. However, it's not just the Old Testament that gives us character. It's the New Testament. Uh, again, almost any New, well, literally any New Testament book you pick, any book of the Bible you pick, it's a book that's telling us what we need to put in, either by Bible verses directly telling us what needs to go in, or by examples telling us what needs to go in and what needs to come out. One of the books that I like is the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, I believe it's verse number 12. Paul gives an admonition to his readers. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You know what that means? That means turn God loose in your life. Turn God. It means don't ride with your foot on the brake. Don't ride with, uh, when I was a kid growing up, learning how to drive, and I've thought about it some in the last few weeks as I was thinking about this. Man, I, I can't tell you how many times somebody told me don't ride with your foot on the brake. Don't ride with your foot on. Now, it's kind of hard for me to have done that because I was learning how to drive in a clutched automobile. You've got to be pretty fast to get your foot off that clutch and back onto that brake. But thinking about it, I understand why a young person learning how to drive would want to have a foot on the brake. You want to make sure you can stop in a hurry. Uh, you're not used to driving. And if something comes up, you want to get your foot on the brake quick. So you have that tendency to keep that foot near the brake. Problem is, if you do that for long, you get kind of lazy and the foot starts to rest on the brake. And you start riding that brake. And it's engaged whether or not you mean for it to be engaged or not. You'll wear out the brake pads, plus confuse whoever's behind you. So you get told a lot when you're learning how to drive, don't ride 
the brake. Can I tell you? A lot of God's people riding the spiritual brake. You're keeping God from exploding inside of your life, from changing you, from altering you, from working out of you what God has put in to you. What God wants to do is God wants to shine through every pore of your skin. God wants to shine through every action of your life. God wants to work out His salvation in your life. How is that done? It's done by God putting into your life the attributes of God Himself. I think this man, Gideon, was a man who had character. But number two, I think he was a man who had courage. To be absolutely honest with you, if I had not looked up the word valor, to see how much more it meant than just courage, I would have said valor means courage. Because in my mind, when I think he's a man of valor, I think that means he's a man of courage. It's interesting. Just like we get to determine how much character there is inside of our life, we get to determine how courageous we are in our life. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, preacher, you don't know me. I have a tendency to be a little bit fearful. I frighten easy. But in truth, you just don't understand what courage is. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the determination to do right regardless of how fearful you are. Say that again. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the determination to do right regardless of how fearful you are. The angel of God appears to Gideon. Verse number 12, thou mighty man of valor. Does that mean he had no fear? No, not at all. As a matter of fact, as you continue to read through the life of Gideon, you'll find out he had quite a bit of fear. And it came out in several times. Look, if you would, over the book of Judges chapter number 6 and pick up reading at verse number 36. Have you ever heard about the fleece? Putting out a fleece. First person to ever do that was Gideon. Uh, Judges chapter 6 verse 36. And Gideon said unto God, If thou will save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said. Verse 38, and it was so, for he rose up early in the morning and thrust the fleece together and wring the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Now, let me ask you a question. Why in the world did Gideon say, if you're going to do what you promised you do, let me have a test. I'll put this wool fleece out. And if you're going to do what you said you were going to do, let the fleece be wet and the, dry, the ground be dry. Why did he do that? Because he was scared. He was scared. By the way, you don't know what God's going to ask him to do yet. And you don't know how extreme what God is going to ask him to do actually is. This man had good reason to be fearful. To be honest with you, some people think having courage is being fearless. The only person who's fearless is a foolish person. There are situations where if you're not afraid, you're not thinking. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is doing what's right regardless of your fear. Gideon said, give me a test. Gets up the next morning and he rings the fleece out. That's it. He's no longer fearless. Fearful, right? No, not at all. You read the next two verses. The same time he's wringing that fleece out, he turns right back around and says to God, all right, all right, let's do it the other way this time. This time, let's let the fleece be dry and let's let the ground around the fleece be wet. Wait a minute. Gideon, why are you asking for that? You're wringing the fleece out into a bowl. Uh, you've just proven that God's answering your prayers and that God's going to be with you. Why are you doing that again by reversing the request? Because he's still afraid. He's still afraid. You say, well, surely those two times took care of it. No, not at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, God actually volunteers a sign for him because he's still fearful. fearful. Look at chapter number 7, verse number 10. Chapter 7, verse number 10. This is God speaking to Gideon. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Purah, thy servant, down the host. Notice how God begins this. If you're still afraid, 
If you're afraid to do what I'm about to ask you to do, then you and your servant go down and do what? Verse number 11. And thou shalt hear what they say. And afterwards shall thy hands be strengthened to go down to the host. Then went he down with Pura, his servant, under the outside of the armed men that were in the host. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along the valley like grasshoppers for a multitude. And their camels were without number as the sand of the seaside for multitude. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, behold, I dreamed a dream. And lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian. And it came into a tent and it smote it that it fell and overturned it. And the tent lay along. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for his hand hath God, for into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, that he worshiped and returned unto the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. Do you understand? He was a fearful man, yet the Bible says, thou mighty man of valor. He was still a very courageous person. You and I are living in a strange time. I think I say that three or four times every single message, but it's because you and I are living in a strange time. And more than likely, more than likely, if you're standing with God, if you're standing for the things of God, more than likely you're going to get a chance to be a Gideon. You're going to have an opportunity. You're just a common person. Prayerfully, you're a cleansed person, a saved person. But you're going to have the opportunity to demonstrate both your character and your courage. What you're made of, and not whether you're afraid or not, but whether you will do right regardless of your fear. You'll probably face some fearful things in the future. But your determination to do right will demonstrate what type of courage you have. God's looking for a person. When God found Gideon, God found a man with character. That's not only he found when he found Gideon. Number four, he found a man that was conformable. Conformable. Now, that's usually not a word that I use as a good word. Typically, I would say if you're conformed, especially to the world, that's a bad thing. However, if you're conformed to the things of God, that's actually a good thing. God wants men, women, boys and girls that will conform to his commands. There's a big emphasis in Gideon's life on fearing not. As a matter of fact, through these three chapters where Gideon is mentioned, God is constantly dealing with with fearful men, not just fearful men, but men that have no courage. There's a reason why God was looking for somebody that despite his fear would do that which is right. And it was because God was going to ask of Gideon a very difficult thing. First of all, he was to fight the Midianites. The Bible describes them. Go back if you would, chapter 7, verse number 12. Excuse me, chapter 6, verse number 33. Chapter 6, verse number 33. And let's read what the Bible says about the Midianites. It says, Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. The Bible's describing the army that makes up the Midianites. Now, the Midianites were a pretty strong nation. They were down to the south of Israel. By themselves, they were a pretty stalwart nation, but they weren't by themselves. Bible says they had the aid of several others. Bible describes the Amalekites that were with them. That would be some of the Edomites, some of the descendants of Esau. And then it describes the children of the east. That would be either Ammon or Moab or both Ammon and Moab. So we've got at least four nations. And the truth is there could have been more because all it says is the children of of the east, there might have been more kingdoms that had come against the nation of Israel. How many of them were there? Now go to chapter 7, verse number 12. Notice again what the Bible says. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And their camels were without number as the sand 
of the seaside for multitude. The Bible describes them, the soldiers, as being like grasshoppers filling up the valley. You've probably never seen anything like that because we don't see things like that in the United States of America. We've got seasons, water comes, rain comes, literally all times of the year. When it gets nice and warm, we get to hear crickets chirping and the frogs croaking. And we never see a massive swarming of the crickets. But in that part of the world, those type of insects follow the rain. And the rain only comes twice a year. Maybe you've heard of locusts, swarms of locusts. Don't normally hear of swarms of grasshoppers, but if you think swarms of locusts, and if you've ever seen a video of locusts, they can be so thick in number that you can't even see the sky. They can lay along the ground so that you can't see a single piece of dirt, a rock, or a blade of grass. They can be as thick as a blanket laid across the valley. And the Bible describes these soldiers as being grasshoppers that covered up the entire valley of Jezreel. Part of the valley of Jezreel is Megiddo's valley. We know a good bit about Megiddo from the book of Revelation. We know one of the end time battles is going to take place there. Megiddo is in the valley of Jezreel. This is a large valley. It's one of the largest valleys in Israel. And there were so many soldiers that they looked like grasshoppers covering the valley of Jezreel. God asked for some pretty difficult things. We haven't read it yet. The Bible says they were like a, a number so large grasshoppers would be covering the ground. We'll find out that Gideon starts with an army of 32,000. He starts with an army of 32,000. God tells him something. Notice what God tells him. If you would look at chapter number seven, verse number two. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into thy hand, lest Israel vaunt themselves, saying, mine own hand hath saved me. <laughs> now, if I'm Gideon, I'm thinking, can you have too many soldiers? Uh, I'm thinking that's kind of like potato chips. Nobody can have enough. I mean, you, you, just, you just need more and more and more. Uh, he's got 32,000. The Bible will tell us. We'll read it in just a few moments. 32,000. He's going out against an army that looks like grasshoppers filling up the valley of Jezreel. And God says to him, you've got too many soldiers. There's a reason why God wanted somebody who would not let fear drive him away. Somebody who might be afraid, but still have courage, the determination to do right, regardless of how fearful they were. God devises a plan to reduce his army of 32,000 down a little bit. Pick up at verse number three. Now, therefore, go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people 20 and 2,000, and there remained 10,000. That's where we get the figure. He started with 32. And now God simply says, if you're scared, go home. Now, wait a minute. Uh, everybody was fearful that day. Like I tell you, just because you've got courage, it doesn't mean that you're not afraid. However, 22,000 were not just fearful, they lacked courage. How do you know they lacked courage? Because courage is doing what's right, even if you are afraid. What was right? I might be scared to death, but there's a war that needs to be fought, fought, a battle that needs to be won. I'll stay even though I'm afraid. Only 10,000 were courageous enough to stay. There's a reason why God's looking for people who will not be dominated by fear. I'm not a Calvinist. I don't think Calvinism is taught the Bible. But I heard the joke years ago about the Calvinist. Fell down a flight of stairs, just kept tumbling and tumbling. Finally, at the bottom of the stairs, he gets up. He's got a broken foot, twisted ankle, twisted arm. He watches his brow, says, thank God that's over. And so it is. I imagine Gideon thought to himself, I wish we hadn't sent those soldiers away. Whew. Thank God that's over. At least I got 10,000. And I got God on my side. Gideon, it's not over yet. Notice what God tells him next. Look at verse number 
4. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many. Bring them down into the water and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. Now, I don't have the time to read the verses. But God takes them down by the creek. And at the creek, he says, I want you 10,000 guys to drink water. Out of the 10,000 people, 9,700 of them, get down on all fours and suck water out of the creek, not bringing it up to their mouth, but get down on all fours and lap it up, kind of like a dog would, getting his face down the water, not understanding that they're soldiers and that soldiers need to be on alert watching for the enemy. Only 300 knelt down on their knees and brought the water in their hand up to their mouth so that they could keep watching what was going on around them. God said, with those 300, I'll give you the victory. There's actually another truth there. God's not just looking for a common man, a cleansed man, a courageous man. He's also looking for a man who's got common sense. Enough sense to know, hey, if you're a soldier, you don't go blinking your eyes, you stay alert. However, God's primarily dealing with the 300 here and not with Gideon, so I'm not going to make that a main point, but I do want you to know God's looking for people that's got some common sense. And in this world that we're living in today, that's few and far between. By the way, just like you get to determine how much character you've got, and just like you get to determine how much courage you've got, you've got a big part in determining how much common sense you've got. The people that you hang around with will influence you more than you realize. And I'm afraid in this world today, most people are following the foolish instead of following the wise. It takes more than good company to make you a wise person. But my friend, if you're hanging around in a foolish crowd, it doesn't take much more than that to make you a foolish person. God was looking for somebody with common sense. But he brings them down to the creek. He tries them. And as a result of his test, that 32,000 is whittled down to 300 men. At the most, 300 plus Gideon, 301 men. Wait a minute. I'm thinking 301 men versus an army of soldiers that lay across the Jezreel Valley like a, a bunch of crickets covering the land like a blanket and 301 men are supposed to go and fight that type of an army. Four at least nations of soldiers, camels that can't be numbered, soldiers that are so great in number they look like grasshoppers across the plain, and 301 men are supposed to fight that army. If you're thinking, you've got to be thinking, surely God's going to do something. I mean, maybe God's going to give them some great weapons. Maybe this is where God gave the Gatlin gun. I mean, maybe this is where God gave the rocket launcher. Maybe, maybe this is where we got into nuclear weapons. God's going to give some type of advantage to those 300 soldiers, right? Not actually. Read if you would. Verse number 16. Chapter 7, verse number 16. And he, Gideon, divided the 300 men into three companies. And he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. <laughs> you notice something's missing there? They've got a trumpet in one hand. They've got a clay pot that has a lamp inside it in the other hand. Their hands are full. I don't know if you're noticing, but there's something missing there. They don't have a weapon. They don't have a sword in their hand. They don't have a spear in their hand. By the way, you can't put a spear in your pocket. They don't have a sword in their hand. They don't have a spear in their hand. They, the Bible doesn't even mention that they've got a bow with arrows slung across their shoulder. Now, maybe they did. Maybe they did. But what the Bible says that they had, this was their weapons. They've got a clay pot with a lamp on the inside and they got a trumpet in the other hand. What weapons are they carrying? Not much. You're thinking, yeah, but this is God. He must have a great plan for them. 
I mean, we've read about what he does in the past. He parts the Red Sea. He brings the east wind across. He causes fire to come down out of heaven. Uh, maybe he's going to send a swarm of killer bees. M maybe he's going to send a, a plague. Maybe he's going to send the angels of God. Surely there's a great plan. Again, not so much. Look at verse number 17. And he, Gideon, said unto them, Look on me and do likewise. And behold, what I, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, ye shall do. When I blow with the trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye on the trumpets also on every side of the camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Here's his plan. You do what I do. When I blow on the trumpet, you blow on yours. When I shout the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, you shout the sword of the Lord of Gideon. That's the plan. That's the, now maybe there's a little bit more. By what they do, maybe there were two more steps. They're supposed to take that clay pitcher and dash it on the ground so that all of them once they can see there's lights springing up all the way around them. And, and when they do that, the Bible says, then they're to stand still. Bible specifically says they stood still. Here's the plan. You break the picture, you shout aloud, you toot the trumpet, and then you stand there. Don't run towards the camp. Don't run from the camp. You just stand there. Wait a minute. There's 300 men. They're going up against an army that can't even be counted. It looks like a bunch of crickets laying along the horizon. And they're told to take for their weapons a clay pitcher, a trumpet, toot the trumpet, break the pitcher, stand in your place. Could I just tell you, these guys were climbing up the tree of obedience and hanging out on the limb of faith and God was snatching the earth out from under them. Do you realize if God doesn't do something, there ain't no way in this world those 300 guys are going to survive. They, they don't have enough weapons to attack. And if they did, they couldn't beat an army like that. They're told to stand still, which means they're not to run away. They're to stand in their place. There's not a way that they could flee. There's not a way that they could fight. If God doesn't do something, these men will die as sure as the earth revolves. What kind of people do that? Conformed people. Those who are courageous. Scared? I bet you saw 301 guys' knees knocking that morning. But going to do what's right. Why? Because God told them to do what God told them to do. What did God do? Notice what God did. Pick back up verse number 19. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came into the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. And they had but newly set the watch and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow with them. And they cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp and all the host ran and cried and fled. And the 300 blew the trumpets and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shittah in Zareth and to the border of Abelahola unto Tabith. What took place? They broke the trumpets. They sounded the horns. They stood in their place. And the confusion of those men waking out of a deep sleep with all of that sound, seeing all of those lanterns all around them burning, caused them to understand they were attacked. But they didn't see an enemy, so they assumed the enemy was their comrades. And they began to slay themselves. The Edomites slaying the Midianites. The Moabites slaying the Ammonites. And this didn't just happen for a few minutes. The Bible indicates that it starts here in these verses and the battle continues to rage all the way over to the book of Judges chapter 8 verse number 21. They began to carry this battle not just in the immediate camp, but as the camp breaks up and the armies start to divide. Then Jews begin to come in and begin to follow this army as it's fleeing back. 
The Bible describes the great host of Jews that come in, many of whom had never been a part of the battle at all, some of whom had been a part of the battle, but in the midst of all the panic had fled away or gone away. Some, the Bible says, were even Jews who had turned to the side of the Midianites. They were working for the Midianites. And when they saw what God was doing, they saw what Gideon was doing, they began to turn against the enemy and God gave Israel a glorious battle causing the flight of aliens, causing those who did not belong in their land to flee out. Why? Because God found somebody. God found a person. In this case, it happened to be a man. We could find instances where God found a woman. In this case, it happened to be an adult, but we could find situations where God found a youth. God found somebody who was just common, like everybody else, but was cleansed, got saved, had courage, and then would conform to the things of God. And God turned the nation of Israel's oppression into victory. I look in a crowd like we have in here today, and I wonder, do we have some common people? Be honest, I don't see much else. I don't see lawyers and doctors. I don't see rich and famous. I see just common people. Do we have cleansed people? People who have been down on their knees and been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, I pray so. I may not know who you are by name. I may not know you very well, but I hope and pray that anybody that's listening, Facebook, parking lot, inside, that you've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That just leaves two more things that God's looking for. Somebody with a bit of character and a bit of courage. I'm going to tell you, you can get that from the Word of God. You can get some courage by just standing and doing what's right, even when you're afraid. I was going back through and was noticing the phrase God uses in the Bible quite often from the book of Deuteronomy to the book of Joshua. Be strong and of good courage. Be strong. And he didn't say eat your vegetables and you'll have courage. He didn't say get an education and it'll give you courage. He just said be strong and have, it's used six times. First time it's Moses telling the children of Israel, be strong and of good courage. Then twice, Moses tells Joshua, you be strong and of good courage because I'm not going to the promised land. You're going to have to leave them. Three times it's God telling Joshua, be strong and of good courage. You know how you become strong and of good courage? You just stand your ground when you're afraid and you keep doing what's right. I wonder if there's anybody like that in here. Somebody with some character, somebody with some courage. And I'm wondering if there's some people that will be conformed to doing what God's telling them to do. This is a good time to find out. If there's a God in heaven, he's got to be speaking to somebody in this place this morning. Maybe you're here and you're lost. You need to get saved. Will you be conformed to what God tells you to do? Maybe you're saved, but you're not living like you should. You know you're not living like you should. You're not doing what God's called you to do. Maybe you've got some problems with character in your life. Maybe you've got some problems with the behavior of your life. But God has told you this morning, as sure as you're breathing air, that you need to set some things right in your life. Are you the type of person that can be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ? If we've got the right kind of people in here, God can raise a small army. It might not even be 300. But if God could defeat a mighty army like that with just 300, there's no telling what God could do with a group from this crowd this morning. May God speak to our hearts and may we do what he tells us to do. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach. I thank you for the life of this man Gideon. And again, one of my favorite Bible passages. Lord, because he was a common man and you did extraordinary things with him. Lord, if you could use a Gideon, you could use a Carl. If you could use a Gideon, you could use a Joe. If you could use a Gideon, you could use a Samantha. Lord, whatever our name is, if you could use a Gideon, you could use one of us. Lord, I pray in this day, this time, this hour, we would be who you want to find. Speak to hearts, accomplish your will and work, and we'll give you the praise. For we ask it in Jesus' name.